Finals. Dame Lillard still dealing with speculation. His future with the Blazers could be in doubt. Portland hiring Chauncey Billups, of course, as their new head coach last month. And according to our Adrian Wojnarowski today, Scott Brooks is finalizing a deal to become Billups' top assistant. Yesterday at Team USA practice, Lillard refused to take the bait when asked about his relationship with the team. Take a listen here. But anything that I that I have to say, I'm going to say it directly to to Neil, and I'm going I'm address it directly with with my team. So um, I don't really have nothing to say to you guys about it. You know, it, it's a lot of things being said and um, sometimes words being put in my mouth and I haven't said anything. All right. So, Perk, first of all, that's very Dame, right? Mm -hmm. um, that being said, Up what front. do you think the future holds for him? Look, he's going to start the season off in a trailblazer uniform, I believe. I think he just don't want to speak on the situation because the last time he said something, you know, when they were asking him about the coaching hire and he voiced his opinion. He had to go back and forth with a few Twitter trolls and, and things like that. And people, uh, newspaper writers from the uh, uh, from Portland, from the Portland area. And I think Dame right now just want to be away from that. But I also think he's watching, he's watching the front office and Neil very, very closely. You know, Chauncey was a great hire. That's a great first step. But now you have to get, you have to make sure you uh, get your roster straight. You know what I mean? You have to add those pieces to make him feel like, okay, we're moving in the right direction. And, and well, look, I think this is a good situation for 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 Dame because he learned to perk to you know what Perk said. When you kind of like have that control where they're mm -hmm. like openly saying like, what can we do to calm this situation? You're going to navigate that. But sometimes there are mistakes in navigating that. I think coming out and saying some things and and having his words twisted, he was like, look, anything I say now will be directly to the GM. That way I know if any of this stuff gets out, I know who's responsible. And so I think this should be handled in-house. You might be have to vocalize it outwardly so that they listen to you in-house. But I think he's doing exactly what he should do. He's discussing what's the best way to move forward. They look, they fell to the Nuggets last night. Dame Lillard averaging 34 points a game during this series. Literally nothing more this man could do. But you can't win a playoff series by yourself. And after the game, he was asked if a shakeup is needed in Portland. Here is what he said. I mean, we didn't win a championship. So obviously what, where we are now isn't good enough. I don't know what, what a shakeup looks like for uh, what changes will be made or could be made? Obviously, as is, it wasn't it wasn't good enough. You know, we came up short against a team without the without their starting point guard and shooting guard. Obviously, where we are isn't good enough to to win the championship if it's not good enough for us to get out of a, a first round series uh, with you know two of their best three or four players not on the floor. After the game, Dame also posted this to Instagram. Now, he captioned it with some lyrics from the late, great Nipsey Hussle. Quote, how long should I stay dedicated? How long till opportunity meets preparation? Hmm. Richard, what do you make of that? And what do you think is next for Dame and the Blazers? Well, I think, first of all, you put that out there to let the team know that if you don't make the changes that you kind of are looking for, whether that's a coaching change, whether that's, you know, trading some of the players, then you can go. Now, Dame has been very critical of other teams, like uh, of other players P uh, teaming up. He said stuff to KD, he said stuff to uh, Paul George. I'm positive he said stuff to Paul George, excuse me, on the KD part, but he has been critical of players, so he's starting to get impatient here, especially when you look at the numbers that he puts up. So, I think I think Terry Stotts is probably gone. I think they're going to make some serious moves. They have to do something. Our Dame is going to be out of there. He's in the prime of his career, and all of a sudden, preparation meets opportunity. This is the opportunity right now. Well, here's the thing, right? What moves can you possibly make? Because nobody is really wanting to go to Portland. So if I'm if I if I had to give advice to Damian Lillard, I would tell him, get out. Get out fast. Go. Go. Perk. Because he's waste yes, because Rachel, look, he's wasting his talent right now. And it, it's similar to the same situation with Kevin Garnett. 
where he carried the franchise and he couldn't get over the hump when KG was in Minnesota. They're, they're around the same age. KG was going on 31. Dame is about to be 31. Like, how long is he going to continue to do his part and not have the supporting cast? KG had to make the decision that it was time for him to leave. I think it's time for Dame to do the same. You know what KG said was one of the great mistakes of his career was not going to Boston long. Center. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and <laughs> I think it's a career crossroads for Dame. And, you know, the league is like, look, I, I know I know what Dame has said. He is on the record many times is how he feels about this. But the league is watching this very closely. And while I'm not going to overlook and look too much into a song lyric because that can be dangerous, he knew exactly what the reaction would be by putting that on there. And that is an indication that he is beginning to turn the screws and the league is watching and waiting and there are teams out there getting ready for this and I don't know if Dame is going to be involved in the coaching potential coaching search I don't know if they, they, Dame would give advice on free on free agency I don't know if Dame would give advice on trades but the Blazers better hope that he does because if it's silence that is a bad sign yeah, I think that's a great point, right? I mean, I have to think if you are Blazers ownership, your reaction to Damian Lillard saying, I'm not really happy in terms of X, Y, or Z is wonderful, Dame. We will change X, Y, and Z for you. I will say, Perk, Mello went to Portland. Players sometimes go to Portland, just saying. But I want to look at their whole landscape. Dame is under contract through 2025. Notable free agents include Norm Powell. Carmelo Anthony, as I just mentioned, at his canter. They don't have any picks in the upcoming draft, though. And as for Yusuf Nurkic, his contract partially guaranteed. Listen to what he said after last night's game. Nurk, do you want to be back next year? Like, do you want to be back on this team next season? In the right situation, yes. What is the right situation? We'll see. I don't know yet. Because this is not it. I don't know if they have Harvey Dent, where Nurk is from, but that was an impressive suit. All right, Brian, so what <laughs> options do the Blazers front office have this summer? Again, if they say to Dame, we get it, you can have the keys to the franchise, Damian Lillard, whatever you want, literally, what should Dame ask them to do? Well, as Richard mentioned, there's a decent chance that Terry Stotts, who's been there a long time, is going to be let go. Um, early idea, a possible candidate there would be Chauncey Billups, who... The deal O'Shea, their general manager, was with in Los Angeles at what they were Clippers. Um, then you have, you know, you know, Nurkic has a partially guaranteed contract that the Blazers are almost certainly going to pick up by August 1st. He wants a contract extension and has hired Rich Paul to negotiate it for him. Uh -oh. So that's what's going on there. So you potentially <laughs> could, if you didn't want to extend him, pick up that and look to trade him. And then you also have C.J. McCollum, who through the years has been a desired player. But remember, whenever you think about trading a guy, you have to think about how this will improve your team. If you trade a guy like C.J. McCollum, you better get a guy back who's just as good as C.J. McCollum or better. And the team who wants to make the deal isn't necessarily looking to trade a better package to get him. So I'm not sure, sure the answer is just, well, just trade C.J. McCollum and get better. I think it's a lot more nuanced. I think it may take Something with Robert Covington, who's under an attractive contract, but they're they're, they're out. that horse. The, the fact that they found a horse that looked like it's about to die before it got to the finish line. <laughs> Kendrick Perkins, Richard Jefferson, we got all kind of guests coming through again today. Going to be a fun show. I do want to put tomorrow's game five into historical context for you guys. This is the 30th instance in which the NBA Finals have been tied in two games apiece. Now, over the previous 29 instances, that's very good odds, friends. The team that won game five has won the series 72% of the time. So, Richard, knowing how important this game is, what adjustments do the Suns need to make after losing two straight? I, I don't really think the Suns need to make too many adjustments. I think they just need some slight tweaks. But ultimately, we've seen, look, if DeAndre, if DeAndre Aiden stays out of foul trouble, if Chris Paul doesn't have one of his historically bad right. postseason, I think the Phoenix Suns win that game. Like you saw, they, they turned the ball over 17 times. They shot 40% and they barely lost. So right. I don't think they need to change too much. 
I do. I think they need to find a swagger and get their tenacity back, right? Turnovers, but offensive rebounds. I think That's DeAndre Ayton, yeah. right? DeAndre Ayton has to do a better job, like he did in Game One and Game Two, controlling the paint, grabbing every single rebound. I believe in Game One he had 19 rebounds, and then he has a, he has to do a better job of actually anchoring the defense up, right? Like getting in there, guarding the pick and roll, defending Giannis at the rim without fouling, like we talked about, but. The Phoenix Suns are going to play better at home, right? You think about Mikael Bridges. He struggled on the road. We know game two, he had a, a breakout performance with 27 points. We know Cam Johnson's going to play better. All the stars, even Devin Booker with Chris Paul and CP3, they're going to play better at home. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I agree that there's not any big tactical adjustment. They made the tactical adjustment in game four, and it largely worked in terms of their Giannis problem, right? Giannis didn't go for 40 plus again. But when you guys say DeAndre Ayton has to stay out of foul trouble, when you say Devin Booker has to stay out of foul trouble, it's easier said than done, right? Yes. I mean, it's not really completely up to them. You can be more careful. You can be more disciplined. But the bottom line is this Suns roster is thin. They yeah. have definitely had injuries throughout these playoffs. And Dario Saric going down after game one with that torn ACL means there's no wiggle room for DeAndre yeah. Ayton. There's no one really to be able to pick up that slack for him. Yeah, but Rachel, if you look at some of uh, Ayton's and, and Devin Booker fouls, uh -huh. they're dumb fouls. Like, Jeez. no, 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 yeah, no, no they are. It's fouls that you can stay away from, like, like, if I'm Monty Williams, I'm going to drill these plays in film session and say, look, stay away from these type of fouls. Like, even Devin Booker, some of those fouls he get, I'm like, why? Yeah. Yeah. Like, a foul why that you... wasn't a foul that really was a was foul right yeah. at the end of the game. That was just a mental. He was going to wrap the guy up to foul on purpose. And, and, and one thing you can do to help whistle. avoid this, like a, a coaching tweak, is take, I know you want to end quarters great, but take your guys out with 30 seconds. Take your guys out with 45 seconds to end the quarters so they don't pick up a little foul with 20 seconds to go unnecessarily. So you take eight and out with 35 seconds to go in the first quarter. So then it's just like, okay, because this is going to be a possession basketball game. They're going to go to somebody specifically. So that's one way that a coach can limit the, uh, the exposure to some of his stars in like little bitty 30 second increments. What are the things that you've heard coaches say in locker rooms or that you've told younger teammates to say, cut down on the turnovers, friend? Well, it's, it's just value in the basketball. I mean, don't try to get outside of your character. Don't make the home run play, right? So many times guys want to make the pass that lead into the shot or they try to do too much. Just simplify the game. Just be who you are. And that's what you, I mean, that's my advice. Yeah, and when you think about the way the Phoenix Suns play basketball, they move it, pop, 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 pops, which you might think that would lead to more turnovers, but it's because they don't play in congestion. Right. They get the ball to the open person and then that person makes the play and makes that .5 second decision. Yep. It's when you're holding on to it, mm -hmm. you're trying to do too much, that's what they have to dial back because it it wasn't just Chris Paul. No. Four guys had three or more turnovers, so that was the whole team. Yeah, and it's that point five is, is the offense that Monty Williams has been preaching, that in half a second, you want to make a decision. Drive, pass, shoot, and that way, as you guys have been saying all week, the ball moves faster than the defenders, mm -hmm. right? Because people can't move as fast as a basketball can. I want to move on to the other side, and Chris Middleton, guys, after that 40-point outburst Ooh. in Game 4, Perk, is it fair to trust him as the series shifts back here to Phoenix in Game 5? He's had some good road games certainly this playoffs he had one in Atlanta that was fantastic but then there's also been a lot of road games he's been quiet yeah but why wouldn't you trust money making Milton okay for the simple fact that I know everyone is talking about his his struggles on the road in in in, in the finals but Game one, he had 29 points. Yeah. I think when it, when it comes down to Chris Middleton, he just has to be aggressive. He had 29 points, but he took 26 shots. In game four, he had 40 points, and he took 33 shots. I don't care. Empty out the clip. That's what I feel like. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like Chris Middleton takes a back seat, mm -hmm. and he waits to see what Giannis is going to yeah. do or Drew Holiday is going to do when the front office. I was on the plane last night with one of the guys from the front office, and they're telling Chris Middleton, shoot the ball. Be aggressive. Be who you are. And if he if he does that from the start, then he's going to come out and have a good game. Well, and that part, like you talk about being harder than you think, the reason why that's so difficult is because Chris Middleton is an extremely efficient player. Yes. He is a 50-40-90 guy. And if you're a 50-40-90 guy, either your ability is off the chart or you kind of have it registered in your head. You miss a couple shots, you slow down. Sure. You get a little tentative. Or you were like, oh, I miss a three, let me go get a bucket. So that's where it's like, to Perk's point, you can go have 29, you can go have 29 points on 26 shots. Mm -hmm. That is not something that he's used 
used to doing, but they want more of that. They right. want that overly aggressive Chris Middleton. Yeah, now those home and road numbers were interesting that they just put up there. Uh, look, I, he's such a steady guy to me, his personality. Mm -hmm. I never see him looking rattled on the road. Mm. Like, some guys don't play well on the road because they just, you can see them getting their heads from the crowd. I never feel like that with Chris. I no. think it's more of him feeling out games and but that's all of that. Big, that's a big difference, and for especially for a guy you consider to be a star. He's about sure. to be on the U.S. Olympic team. Yep. He's got multiple all-stars. Like, this is what you, like, you expect a little bit closer. three-point percentage sticks out, right? The field goal percentage and that plus-minus, which I know is not a be-all, end-all stat, but when you do it over a string of games, it t tends to be more accurate. And they don't have home court, right? They do not so have they home have court to win a series. game on the road. They that is the key do. thing. Yes. But, but then, when you look at those numbers, and especially in the finals, we got to also realize that I want to know how many minutes he played because you remember the game one and game two were blowouts. Yeah. So, you know, those minutes weren't really there. Like, it wasn't meaningful minutes yes, right? like it was in game four. Yep. Well, they will have to win a game in this building. The Milwaukee Bucks will, if they want to win a title, we will see if it's tomorrow night and if Chris Middleton can be a main factor there. Stick with us on the show because coming up, Woj, the NBA and Players Association have agreed to extend the playoff tournament, that play-in format, mm -hmm. through next season. So, yes. Richard, what is your reaction to that? No, I I think it's good. I don't think seven deserves to be in that play-in format. So you want to see them tweak it? I want to see eight. I think eight is a great, great spot. When you do seven, seven has beaten two multiple times. Mm -hmm. Eight has rarely beaten one, so give a lot of teams a shot to go be at that eight spot. But seven is something that you work extremely hard to get. If it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like, look, I love the play-in term tournament the way it is you know keep it that way because it teach teams not to take the regular season for granted and it makes it more competitive no more load managing and doing all that stuff so it keep it the way it is cut down. there's no arguing it cut down on tanking you still had a few teams at the very bottom tanking there's no question but you didn't have the bottom third chunk of teams trying to tank and the reason why that seventh spot is, is it, important it gives you two. is it gives you two, two. right yeah. and also it makes that to get out of that seventh or eighth spot we saw a great competition mm -hmm. in the west to try to just get to that sixth spot, yep. right? Yeah. Regular season games perk being more important. And the seventh spot team does have multiple chances to make it into the playoffs. So I, I, I understand. It, it's you, the playoffs you like before it. the, it's the playoffs. playoffs. before. I just think that you're going to play 80-something games and you finish half game in and our half game out, and now you're out of the post. Tomorrow night. Now, the Suns are 2-0 and in the finals in this building, which will now be called the Footprint Center, by the way. Mm. They got a sponsor mid-series. Wow. This is the Footprint Center, mm -hmm. no longer Phoenix Suns Arena. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, do your feet feel imprinted? Well, when I was here, it was America West Arena, mm -hmm. and then it turned into the Talking Stick Arena, so now it's the Footprint. Mm -hmm. The Footprint Center. Footprint Center. Don't mess that up. Mm -hmm. It don't matter. That means that the Phoenix Suns are going in the right direction. Exactly. Okay. People oh. want to be associated with them. Yeah. Welcome to the jump. I'm Rachel Nichols, still associating with Richard Jefferson, Kendrick Perkins. I don't know how happy they are to be associating with each other, but mm -hmm. I'm grateful to them both. <laughs> I want to talk to you guys about Team USA because there's a lot to keep up with, right? Yes. Here's all the latest. Bradley Beal, who was placed in the health and safety protocol Wednesday, is now ruled out of the Olympics. So he will not go over to Tokyo. Out of an abundance of caution is how it was phrased. Team USA's exhibition with Australia tonight has been canceled. Then today, Kevin Love withdrew from Team USA, citing that right calf injury that plagued him for much of the season. What Love's agent told Adrian Wojnarowski that he is not yet ready for peak performance. Now, with the two roster spots open, Woj reporting Spurs forward Keldon Johnson and three-time NBA champ JaVale McGee are being added to Team USA. Keep in mind that they're also going to get an infusion of these guys who are currently playing in the finals. Devin Booker, Drew Holiday, Chris Middleton, and Jeremy Grant will rejoin the team also after he clears health and safety protocols. He's just in there for contact tracing, we assume, in relation to Bradley Beal. So once he clears that contact tracing protocol, he can rejoin the team as well. That was a lot. Yes. Richard, um, Kevin Love, and you I know have spoken yeah. since this withdrawal happened. I don't know if you have any more insight for us on that. No, I, no, I, I spoke to him, and, and I just think he has so much respect for USA Basketball that he was like, dude, like I thought I was going to be 100%. I hadn't been playing a ton of five-on-five. Five. They gave me the call. I wanted to answer the call. I wanted to play. And then as he started playing more five-on-five five and started banging, he just you know, it didn't feel like 100%. And what he doesn't want to do is disrespect and not be able to play at his peak. So he opened up a spot for somebody else to, to go participate. All right, so given that, Perk, and given the guys and the names that you see are now going to be joining the team, 
Are you feeling the same about Team USA's chances to win gold in Tokyo, or is the last couple of days shaking your confidence there? Well, my confidence has been shook, Rachel, but I'm look, here's the thing. You still have enough firepower to go out there and win, right? And adding ja JaVale McGee, a backup center to BAM, I thought was huge and well-deserved, right? Because JaVale McGee is going to do his role. He's going to block shots. Here's the problem that I have, right? Greg Popovich being biased towards his franchise and putting on Keldon Johnson and I'm not knocking the young man I look you know whatever comes his way embrace it with open arms but it's guys out there like Trey Young that are out there begging on social media to be part of this that also should have this opportunity. I can't wait to see Atlanta versus the Spurs yeah, next year. Well, me, I, mean, I cannot like, wait. Like, like like he should be on this team. It's, it's no doubt in my mind and, it, and this is the problem that I have like to me, Pop shouldn't have a say in who picks, like, who gets to come on. He should be able to just to coach the team. It's unfair. Well, look, I mean, it is traditionally up to the front office, quote-unquote, of Team USA, and they do have really good management, executive management there, but the coach has a voice that is traditional with it. It's funny, though, hearing you talk about Trey Young versus the Spurs. We sometimes ask players, hey, does this game mean more to you because, you know, Chris Paul does playing I mean, the conference Gilbert finals Arenas, mean Gilbert more? Well, that. mean more to you because Chris Paul played the Clippers in the conference finals doesn't mean more to you. And most players will just sort of say reflexively, nah, you know, I want to win anyway, or all games are the same. And then we hear you guys talking oh, off yeah. camera. Yeah. No, and no. it's very clear that oh, it's no, not no, actually no, true. Quick, I kid you not. Uh, Gilbert Arenas was talking trash about everybody, every one of the coaches that didn't pick him. He was talking for the put, Olympics. Yeah, for the Olympics. But this is the thing about Trey Young. And if you get an opportunity, you just have to say, hey, Trey, this is going to be our lineup. We want to make sure that you understand that you're going to be the third guard. And so, like, as long as you're OK with that, those are the conversations that you have to have, because what's going to happen is in four more years, you're going to be like, Trey, our guy, our guy, you're come. the best point guard in the league. Come on. <laughs> and then right, it's like he's no. the bad guy if yeah. he doesn't go to USA Basketball. Yeah. Right. And you guys skipped them over. Right. No, I agree. I agree. And, and, you know, look, I don't have a problem with this lineup. I just feel like Trey should have been on this team. I just feel that way. Like, I, I'm not going to dive any deeper into it, but that man should have been on there, especially what he did throughout the postseason. Mm -hmm. I will say that the last two days have not shaken the sentence that I have said since this whole Team USA training camp started. Kevin that team has Kevin Durant, <laughs> so I am not going to worry. No. Doesn't mean there's a lock to win the gold. Those are two separate ideas, but I am not going to worry about a team that has Kevin Durant until we get to the point where it looks like they're being outplayed in one of the medal games. Mm. All right, let's move over to Dallas because Jason Kidd introduced as Mavericks head coach yesterday let's bring back our coaching carousel getting a little thinner now because more people have gotten jobs here's kid on the fit between luca and Kristaps porzingis take a listen kp you know uh again this is a positive summer for him he's healthy right this isn't a time where he's coming off an injury um i think he's really excited about this opportunity i think he's a perfect fit for luca First of all, Richard, look at your guy, J-Kid, up there. The, the nice, thick tie-knot, the, tie, the, the glasses. glasses. and all that. That's not Oakland, J-Kid. That's not <laughs> J-J. We know the it's truth. That's New Jersey that, 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 net, That's J -Kid. New Jersey net. That, That's the, I'm a coach now. I'm the Los Angeles Lakers. Yeah, you're Lakers supposed to grow, man. You suppose, yeah. As you get older, you get wiser. Do you agree with your guy saying that he th Well, okay, what? what? Do I agree? Yes. Would you agree <laughs> with J-Kid saying that he mm. thinks that Chris Epps, Porzingis, and Luca are a perfect fit? I think they are, as long as Porzingis is not the second best player. You can make him the third best player on the team you have to get more help for for Luca Luca is one of those players that he puts pressure on a franchise mm -hmm. he puts pressure on a coach he puts yeah. pressure on an organization because you're like we have a guy that's 20 three years old that's yeah. one of the top five players in this league we have windows to win a championship and if we don't fill that window he's going to go and he's going to be someplace else great for the next 10 years so i just don't think porzingis is nearly enough to be like oh this is the one-two punch i think you're so wrong and here's why when you go back and look two years ago when they were playing in the bubble they were one of the best duos in the bubble was, two years ago three knee they surgeries were, ago no it was not and then by, by the way they both was averaging was <laughs> they was they both was averaging 30 points a game in the bubble. They were coexisting very very well. What happened was was that coach Steven Silas left. 
Okay, he was the magician behind that offense. So yep. now you have to make Porzingis feel wanted. If you're Jay Kidd, you have to go and have a sit down with Luka and say, hey, look, you can't dominate the ball 95% of the time. You only could dominate the ball 60% of the time. We're going to feature Porzingis in our offense. We're going to run sets for him. We're going to put him in position to be successful. He, that didn't happen in this postseason. He was standing around the three-point line along with everybody else watching Luca dance with the ball for 20 seconds out of the 24 seconds on, on the shot clock and then making a pass saying, hey, catch and shoot. That's not who Porzingis is. Even if you put Porzingis in a spot where he's averaging 20 a game again, I still don't think that that team has enough. So I, I, we, we can disagree on whether or not Porzingis can be the we second disagree. best player. That's fine. That's fine. But even if he goes back to getting featured in 20 points a game, that's not enough to get this Mavericks pass four teams in this conference. Well, look, it would be good for them if they could get past the first round. That's something that they would like to build on and be able to there's do. But there's no idea. question that it's not just pressure on Jay Kidd to make the, the roster work and to make the Chris Stapps luka relationship good. There's pressure on new a new head of the front office, mm -hmm. Nico Harrison. I don't know. Is this title president, general manager, executive what vice up, president? Nico? Whatever it is, he's very important and he's now running the front office in Dallas. Um, everyone's title structure is different in, in every team, but it is putting pressure on them because whether you also believe that KP is a great fit or answer there, it doesn't feel like that is a ch championship level roster at this moment. Well, no. but, well, Rich just said even if he's averaging 20 points, it's not going to get them over the hump. By the way, they took the Clippers to seven games and he wasn't averaging 20 points. If you have a better Perzingas at that time, then the Dallas Mavericks will win that series and possibly be in the conference finals where the Clippers were. So I'm not go I, like I'm not sold on that. Okay, cool. That's fine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be very yeah. interesting to see the arms race in the offseason. All these teams out West obviously don't total in the last three games. So, Richard, what kind of pressure is there on Chris Paul specifically to turn things around in Game 5? All the pressure. All the pressure. There, If there was one person that I had to point to that had the most amount of pressure, it would be Chris Paul. Mainly because it's like if you look at the stars over on the Milwaukee Bucks, they got a lot of length in front of them. You got Giannis is going to play 10 more years, Chris Middleton. You looked at the young players on the Phoenix Suns. You right. got Devin Booker and Mikael Bridges. These guys are going to play in their 10, 10, 15 years. You really have Chris Paul, who respectfully is at the end of his prime, and he's had a long prime, yeah, yeah. but he's still in his prime. And so it's it's all just has to be him, right? What he's going to do, how he's going to play. And I think that some of the things might creep in there, some of those playoff, like, unfortunate mishap that he's been a part of. It's Look, right at this point, Chris Paul, yes, he has to play better, but this is just icing on the cake, right? Him getting to the finals with what? this young core was what? good enough, but they have people like RJ. What icing wanna, on the cake? Wanna, this is a, wanna, a, champ listen, a champ listen, championship, they have not icing. People, they have people like RJ <laughs> like who, try to, who try to go up here and try a lot of them, but they have people <laughs> like they have people like RJ that want to try to define winning championships for somebody legacy, right? Well, Chris Paul has done throughout the course of his career because he wanted no, to talk about... He's a Hall of Famer. He's a top... He's a top five point guard of all time. Wrong. And look, this is what this is what RJ is so wrong. He wants to bring up, oh, his past history in the playoffs and he had a history of doing this. Well, sometimes it's just the personnel around you. Sometimes you could be doing your part, but the others could not be doing theirs. And here's the problem that I have with winning championships and people overthinking this situation. This is a team sport. This is not this is not boxing. This is not tennis. This is not golf. Sometimes you just don't have the personnel. So when you talk about Chris Paul and you talk about his overall achievements and what he did for each organization that he went to, the culture, he is a no, winner. Wait, 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 wait. Per Relax. Per he is a winner, okay? He is a winner. I just want everybody to know that. He has changed the culture everywhere he went. He is a top five PG because I heard some of your takes this morning right. and I was listening to you. you unfortunately. He's not a top I will, five. I will yes, just he is. Give, I'm I will in just my give, right mind. I will just give some numbers. The man has played, I think, 126 playoff games. Mm -hmm. So when you have played more than 120 <sighs> playoff games, there will be some bad ones in there. Yes. But if you look at the overall of what he has done in the playoffs, the top three in the categories that matter for a point guard is him, 
Oscar Robertson and Zeke. Dude, do that's Rachel. That's Rachel. The do, do not do not so listen, listen. Rachel, don't no, no. put him in this a body is, bag. This is not like about this is not about legacy. Zip this is not about legacy. All right, we got, we got we got an actual bridges. player in this nothing. series yeah, waiting this, to yeah, join us. In the finals, talking about yeah, top yeah, point guards. Yeah, we got Bridges. Is he going to win a championship? The Jones Mikael Bridges is right here on the jump, and and Mikael, I'm sorry that these guys basically. This is what I have to deal with all day. Is just the two of them into each other. I bet you could add some to this discussion about what a strength. Chris Paul has been in your organization and especially during these playoffs. Why don't you chime in? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, you see where we're at. You know, he got us where we're at right now. Um, he's a great leader, great person. Um, that's, I think that's the biggest thing I learned, that he's just a, a great person. Um, so, uh, you know, what he does on the court and off the court is just unbelievable, and he just helps us to where we're at right now. Thank you. See, it's now mm -hmm. three against one. Okay. Mikhail, Kendrick, me against Richard. Thank I'll, you, Mikhail. I, I'll <laughs> wait for my question. I got you. <laughs> well, <laughs> Mikhail, big here, man. Hey, I'm a huge fan of yours. I enjoy watching you play. I wanted to ask you, uh, what did you do different as far as with your game two performance? And then you kind of struggled in game three and game four. How can you get back to that game two, Mikhail Bridges? Um, just being ready, uh, just being more aggressive. Uh, I think Milwaukee just did a just a great job in general, just with their defense and trying to make it play two on two. You know, not helping off all of us as much, but um, I think just trying to find and mix it in, try to uh, you know, mm -hmm. offensive rebound, try to mix it in, try to get myself going. Well, uh, Mikael, Richard Jefferson here. Uh, look, I know you won two national championships, so you don't believe in participation trophies. You're not just happy to be there. So just I I explain to the people at home, are the Phoenix Suns just happy to be there, or are you guys expecting to win a championship? Because right now it's championship or bust if you only have two games left. Um, yeah, obviously that's what we've been on you know we want to win uh that's what we've been preaching at the beginning of the season obviously we want to get better every single day but our main goal was to be the last team standing so um yeah for sure especially making it this far i don't think you know anybody will be satisfied with losing and be just okay we made it this far I, that's just that's like a, that's a loser mentality for sure how did playing in those experiences, and I, I say it's invaluable, I played in the Final Four, wasn't fortunate enough to win a national championship. How did those games prepare you for these type of moments? You, you know, first one, you know, two out of three. Yeah, uh, I mean, it does, but like I always tell people, I'm like, the NBA Finals is just, it's a whole different level. And, um, mm -hmm. but we're, we're, we're ready. Uh, you know, we, we, we played, you know, we won every, as much games as we can in the regular season to have this uh, home court advantage. So, you know, I'm happy we got two out of three here. So uh, we're going to take advantage of it and just play our way. Well, look, the great NFL Hall of Fame head coach, Bill Parcells, used to say the best ability is availability. You have the best ability of anyone in the NBA right now. Your impressive Ironman streak is pretty insane. You have never missed a game, not one, in college or the NBA, and now have the longest active game streak in the league right now. What has been the key for you to staying healthy and maintaining that streak? Uh, just... Taking care of my body, you know, having organization, the guys here help me, you know, take care of my body with strength conditioning and recovery. Um, and just even when I feel a little banged up, just go out there and play. I think I got that just from Nova where you never miss a game unless you really can't play at all. So um, just having that mentality, no matter, even if I'm banged up, just to go out there no matter what. Nice. Mikael, hey, look, you got a lot of guys that like to get down and dance in the locker room after y'all be <laughs> celebrating. I'm watching Big Aiden and campaign. If y'all win this championship, are we going to see clips of you doing, I don't know these new dances in this new era, but you going to be joining the fun? Uh, yeah, but we got to get there first. Uh, <laughs> we got to get there first. Then maybe I'll think about it. Yeah. He's got moves, though, guys. Uh, Leah, I can't dance, so that's not something that <laughs> I, I, I have no context there. <laughs> Mikhail, we will let you uh, get back to the rest of practice. Thanks so much for joining us on this busy day, and we'll see you in Game 5 of the Finals tomorrow night. We appreciate you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, all right, everyone else, stick with us because... Oh, we've got producer Steve in my ear saying, we're not even going to break right now. We're going to talk a little bit about Devin Booker. And I want to ask you guys which version of Devin Booker we're going to see tomorrow night. What do you think, Perk?
the same Devin Booker from Game Four. That's the I, one. Yep, that's the one. I, I think when you look when you look at a guy like Devin Booker, right? He's not going to struggle long. He got that out the way in Game Three, and he's just so good at putting the ball in the basket in the, at different areas, right? He he doesn't have any flaws in this game offensively. No, no, I I, I agree. I, I think once he, if you saw that over the, we talked about that over the past week, is that his Game Threes over a couple of series, he kind of struggled first time on the road, but then he just gets more comfortable and he's like, all right, I got this because he's put